All right, hello and welcome people to Crucible Season 13, Week 8. It's going to be a two-team Crucible. We're looking at Fly Us Closer versus Silly Walk Ministers. And so the teams have gathered. And we will have a special guest very soon. Gonna be here any minute now. So the lobby is kicking off. We're getting ready for the map vote timer to kick off. There we go, it's on. And so Mr. Mutant is the suggested map, however that is subject to change as the team captains are allowed to make a vote for what map they want. Now of course they can't vote for anything already in the suggested map pool and you can see that over at the challenge. Got one vote for Fjords from the uh, Silly Walk Ministers. And that means since the other team did not make a vote, that we're going to be jumping over to Northern Fjords. Four minute timer is live, and that means that the teams can start changing around their ships. Now from the flyers closer, we are seeing a magnet and a goldfish at the moment. Up versus a double junker, and if they keep that, that would be very interesting to see what they do with it. It's not something we usually see. Junkers have been making a bit of a comeback from being completely out of the meta, but their biggest weakness, especially now where the Watcher is so prevalent and the Artemis as well, we've been seeing a whole lot of those, is that the uh, components of the ship are so cramped together on that ship, which makes it very easy to get a whole lot of components in one or two shots with either the Watcher or the uh, Artemis. So we saw a change from the junkers, but that was only a gun change, so we're still seeing the junkers being kept.
One minute left until the ships will be locked. Did you miss anything fun, Alfie? No, you did not. I don't believe. We're still in the lobby for the first game. Waiting to get in and see how the teams will fare against each other. 30 seconds left until the ships are locked. And it seems like the blue team is going to stick with these double junkers. And as such, we are ready to go into the game. Now, from a surface level, it seems like red team is going with something very standard, while the blue team is doing a very unconventional tactic. Also, I think we should have our special guest ready. Hellfire, welcome. Now, what do you think about the um, double junker strats? I think it's an interesting one. It's there are usually ships that can be shut down quite easily once they get balloon popped, uh, which leaves them prone to watcher, leaves them prone to gatling on their balloon, and the red team have a, a goldfish, which is a prime ship for popping junkers. So it will be interesting to see if the blue team can pump out enough control before they start to get popped and watcher. Yeah. Speaking of red team, I'm going to start us off with the Victor Magnuson, the Magnate piloted by Sunstrom, a left side Gatling, uh, Flak and Hawatcha, right side Ga uh, Laser, Artemis and Hawatcha. Then you've got the Suz, piloted by Captain Jan, a Carafish, with a right side Flamer, left side Double Banshee. I think we might have to wait on the blue teams. <laughs> See a pop go out in the middle of the loose. Yeah, you know, that was a bit expected considering the um, ease of access to the balloon and the fact that they have a carrowfish on the red team. So they managed to um, avoid the arm shots before they could turn the pop, so they, uh, they kept the arm, they kept the carnage, and they got the pop before they got the gun disabled. And now it looks like Whale on the Loose is out of the fight. Leaving one of frogs in a 2v1 situation. Yeah, and that's the big danger when a carronade is involved because if you sink one ship, you can just leave the other ship completely isolated to be picked off. And there we go. Red team takes the first point. Ship number three, which is about to die. <laughs> and then she its way along the loose. It's a Adam's front with a Banshee Gatling inside and the Aiden's Mine Launcher side. Yeah, and they're gonna get crushed on the rocks there, but one can assume that maybe those mines were kind of a deterrent for the fish to get them off them. It's certainly true, mines are effective against goldfishes. Fish doesn't have too much acceleration, so it's kind of predictable. And you can also plant a mine off to the side of a fish. And because of its long profile, it's actually quite easy to land an effective mine that way. However, a mine itself is not enough to stop 
a goldfish. Especially when there's also a magnate taking it. This ship spawns the north. And it seems yeah, like so let's take a look at ship wiser. number four there as well. That's what a frogs piloted by where am I? It's a Gatling front, Armist side, and Gatling flat side. And it seems like Red Team really predicted the um, the further away spawn, the one behind the arc there. But they go bust. Yeah, and we, I don't think we really see them gain too much from this position. The Junkers probably won't want to assault the fish across here, because it's quite uh, high ground. Which would mean they wouldn't have to very far to fall before they hit the ground. It's quite a dangerous place for the Junkers, if they choose to fight here. Yeah, the water frogs is, is engaging very low. And maybe the Roos is sneaking in the high, but he's not ready to engage. He's turning his guns now, and it looks like they will focus going on Magnuson. Can they get the full freight? I just go out early. If you get the whole break, there are no explosives going on. And they get the whole back up, and Magnus is going in for the run with one of the frogs. Hits the run, breaks the hole, gets the flats in. Ooh, Ships very aggressive play, down. and paid off. I think the junglers don't have enough kill power, or they don't execute it fast enough, because they had a really good position on the Victor Magnuson in that case. But they weren't able to do a whole lot with it. That was definitely a case of execution. Uh, um, it is kind of a shame that Vale on the Loose is the flanking ship, because it has less piercing than the double gat link of the water frogs. Which meant that they were breaking the hole slower. They also had a banshee piling before the hole broke. So when the hole did break, the banshee was on reload, and the water frogs had its armor turns instead of its flag. So Definitely partly an execution from there. Um, but one does wonder whether it would be better to send in the other ship. Um, especially because one ship's got the double gatling flag, which is good for killing, the other ship's got the mine launcher, which is good for surviving the fish. So it probably makes more sense for the double gatling flagship to be sneaking around here. Yeah. Yeah, it nice seems like Red Team it. now. Yeah, Red Team seems to be. Oh. Denying this spawn and they spawned in it, which is a very dangerous choice. Because <laughs> now they're not going to be quite ready and the disables are already going out. Get yeah, that it down, which is really useful for them. Can they capitalize on it before the fish comes in and pops it? Victor Magnus and Paul Broken. One out of us, two. Three, four. Three, four, yeah. That's good perma damage, but it might just not be enough as the fish is now on them. Well on the loose is getting out, but slowly. He needs to use Hydro. He can double Hydro, but he chooses not to because he wants to save his ally from the fish. Yeah, and there we go. First match in favor of the um, Fly Me Closer. But I would also like to say that the ship choice of the Silly Walk Ministries was a very, uh, or Ministers, was a very risky one, a very high reward, uh, but also very high risk with the Artemis and everything, because if they lock down the fish, they're in a good spot. But they could also just get popped and then have two dead guns on the ship. It's a very hard composition to pull off. I think that maybe... It's possible to win here with a double junker, but they could have been using more specialized ships to really help that mine launcher um, against the fish and to really focus on executing the magnate at any opportunity that they got. Uh, maybe just another flak, another gatling, um, a carinated mine side with a banshee against the fish. I think that's what we, we'd be looking for here. It was definitely a hard composition for them to use. It's not paid off for them. Yeah, especially with what they went up against. There were a lot of 
the known enemies of the Junker were the Hiwachas, the uh, Carronades, and even an Artemis thrown in there for good measure. Looks like they're looking for something slightly more conservative here. They're now pairing the mag the Junker with a Magni. And it seems like the teams do want to stay on Derelict Deception here, at least the um, blue team. The Flyers closer. For those confused, they do swap places after each match, so... And we are going to be staying on Derelict Deception. No, I mean, first match might have looked a bit one-sided, but I think it's important to know uh, as well in, in Crucible that the teams are just feeling each other out, and they're also feeling each other out within the teams because they might not be people who usually play together in the crucible you get kind of thrown together by an algorithm or by people by a shadowy council this is true so the teams are mixed but we have seen quite a range of high level players in fact there's only one player in the entire lobby who is not prestiged so there's quite a lot of experience and these players have played with each other from time to time. And looking back at the last game, I think that it looked like they were fairly coordinated, um, not perfectly in sync, as you would expect from a team that plays it with each other week in, week out. But they were still uh, executing good maneuvers, and I think really what they want to build on is their ship picks. Yeah. Yeah, we're seeing some big changes from last match. Uh, Sunstrom still sitting on his Magnate, but Captain John now bringing in a Spire. Uh, we see a Magnate and a Corsair from the red team. So, a completely different match from the first one. He's been seeing every ship equipped with balloon popping capabilities. And both teams have both Lumberjacks and Heavy Paranoid. Right, so a lot a lot of popping fire no matter the um, distance. Well, that's probably going to be the name of the game then, with not getting popped and uh, isolated down on the ground with the rest staying up. And it's, however, we only see one watcher on either side and we see two out of eye on Victor Magnuson which could be problematic if they're getting popped and they're not able to use those guns but if they can gain control before the fight reaches that point they should be in a good position Yeah, a lot yes. like uh, last game with the high risk, high reward with bringing the Artemis. They are going to be dead if you get popped, but if you manage to lock them down, they're worth a whole lot. Mm. But I, I can see it becoming problematic because if the Spire's been shot too hard and the Magnate just doesn't have arc, the blue team have no explosive. And I think that could actually be a deciding factor here. Because what they really need to do is they need to be ready to kill that Corsair and either of their ships need to be ready to kill that Corsair if they can force a hull break. And I'm not sure if they have quite enough there to make that happen. But um, it will rely on Red getting clever engages because they'll be up against the facing Lumberjack and the Spider. 
and even if they try and flank, the spire can turn immediately. So the, the yeah, Red very good turn rate. Indeed, so Red Corsair will want to be engaging at high velocity, here. and uh, I think that will be the deciding factor. Yeah. Right, and this is what we're going to get. The ships are locked and people are readying up. We are getting ready to move on to the um, second match. With one of the very notable things being then the... Um, the blue team's severe lack of explosive damage. Indeed, and on the other hand, the red magnate has a risky play in him. So, yeah. Looking at the uh, Corsair of the red team, Jupiter, piloted by Dementia, we've got a Carronade up front, Carronade on the right side, and a watch on the left with double Gatling po pointing forwards, and then a Gatling on the back. Then we've got the Minty Breeze, piloted by, by Where Am I? It's got Hades, Flak, and Lumberjack on the left side, and the right side, Hawatcha, Gatling, and Flak. Ship number three is the Victor Magnuson. It's piloted, Magnate piloted by Sinstrom. On the right side, there's a Watcher, Artemis Hades, left side, Heavy Carronade, Artemis Gatling. And ship number four is the Nugget Launcher, Lumberjack Spire, piloted by Captain Yan, with a Gatling, Gatling, and a flat. Now, very interesting flank by the Jupiter there, getting in the middle of the blue ships. Very disruptive Magnuson for them. broken. Fax are going out of Magnuson. Jupiter broken. Fax are not going out in them. The Magnuson's about to be broken here again. Fax have gone out on Jupiter. Will make the Magnuson die here. He's broken. And goes down. Jupiter survives. It was very close though. I mean, that is a very That's... interesting hybrid spire with the double Gatlings, the Flak, and the Lumberjack. Indeed, it, it could have gone out of the way, but um, the Corsair could be dead here. And fortunately for them, they're alive. But they did have the Flak window, and uh, for some reason it was not shot. Uh, Jupiter's popped again, but Spire uh, is in a fishy place. It should be able to escape. Yeah, the armor's still looking good. The balloon, though, is looking a bit iffy. But they've got the drog shoot. Yeah, then they also have terrain behind them. That link's going out on them, and it puts the Spire in a very dangerous place. The engineers are busy running around that ship now, and it's got its back against the wall, and it's, of course, they're a bit <laughs> <laughs> Victor Magnuson's balloon pop, he's not looking good. I think so far all this game, the Jupiter has been allowed to uh, obtain very good positions. It's but he's all broken and watch it does go out on him. Could die here. Oh very quickly. <laughs> Imagine two or three engineers running around on the hook. And the Victor Magnuson low, is forced yeah. back now. And he's low and he's popped. And he's not going to use the Vardomus. This is looking really good for the red team. And Nugget Launch is looking to pop Minty Breeze, but that's not going to stop the Jupiter. And the Minty Breeze will still be able to shoot if he gets popped. So this is not looking good for the blue team. Yeah, the only red problem for the red team is now... yeah? Mm. Yeah, they're not hitting that many shops, but go on. Okay, yeah, no, I was going to say the Jupiter has been taking big risks to secure those kills. Getting in the really good position, taking some beating while the Minty Breeze is allowed to fire without any interruption. They're not going to be able to pull that stunt once more with the um, perma looking like it does. Definitely. I'm surprised they weren't able to act a bit faster here, but they popped a nugget launcher and they're flying in. Are they going to die before they <laughs> do any permanent damage on this fire? <laughs> yep. Yeah, it looks like it.
But if the Minterbees can get out and they can, like, sort of repeat the same engagements with the Jupiter taking some damage and claiming two kills per life, I mean, they're going to be going positive by the end of it. It's possible. But is it likely here to lose one engine again? They are, however, popping the Magnate, so it's not getting the Artemis going. It's not getting any of them going, actually. It would be good for them. Will the Magnus Magnus and prepare for Jupiter? It looks like they're trying to kill the Minterbees. However, the Lumberjack is now going out on the Magnus again. A uh, whole break on Minterbees. Yeah. It's actually going out on the Spire. Jupiter's coming back in. Jupiter almost popped, but not quite. Beautiful flux to kill the Minterbees. Oh, and that's really bad timing for Jupiter. <laughs> yeah. Caught in a really hard place here. He's also using drug shoot, so he's slowing down. Yeah, really, we see no way out for Jupiter. That's a great watcher. Buy him some more time. Nugget launches. Oh. If this continues, though, one might ask if Minterbee is not just not gonna come in in the same position that Jupiter did. Easy, it looks like Jupiter's about to die. Oh, she should be dead, yeah. Well broken, but Flux is not going out yet. It's gonna die regardless. Yeah, that is an oppressive amount of piercing from the blue team. There's a question of which spawn the red team will take and which way the blue team will want to fly. Will they I want think to we should see a four spawn from red team. Yeah, yeah, there we go. They're quite safe there. Jupiter taking an advanced but hidden position. Yeah, so a bit of a split spawn there, it was just always interesting to see. Is a scene by the magnet. Looks like he's using his right side against the magnet, and they're just going for a double focus here. Magnet's close to being popped. Minty Breeze is popped. And has lost two engines. Blue Team is doing a really good job of shooting past Jupiter onto the Minty Breeze. For sure. But Magnuson is now popped. And he might be losing Artemis Arc, if they can sustain the pops. Oh, and po uh, break on the Nugget Launcher. It's such a fragile ship. Manages to avoid losing permanent, but Minty Breeze does not. He loses 60% of his health. The Nugget Launcher is dropping again. He's losing a lot of altitude, he's on a rock at the moment. Yeah, they forced Jupiter out of the way, meaning Minterbreeze is going to be just that bit more exposed now. Mm -hmm. But Magnuson's taking a pounding here, he's close to Holbrook, he gets Holbrook and he's William broken too. Fortunately no follow, because he's in cover. His pie is broken again, he just cannot get into the fight. Yeah, they probably need to do a full reset back up and get that hard cover all the way up so they can get some altitude. Yeah, but it's hard to tell. Both ships, are, both teams are really suffering here. Yeah. Could go either way. Magnuson could break here, yeah. but he's getting distance and he's ready to dodge some flak. Yeah, they went just a bit too close there and actually got inside the Gatling range, which is very dangerous. Jupiter broken. Magnuson broken. <laughs> Jupiter taking blocks. So is Magnuson. So Jupiter's in a really rough spot here. He could put down. Uh, manages to avoid it. I mean, Tabriz has been really strong. I mean, they've got the altitude advantage, but they're taking the fire of both ships right now, and they're still staying out there, yeah. dealing out that damage. They need to focus the Magnuson, but they cannot ignore the Nugget Launcher completely as a team. And letting the Magnuson rise, and I feel like the right side of the Jupiter is not quite effective enough in this long range dilemma.
and actually we see blue team withdrawing even though they've done more damage over this fight. Perhaps they've got a more conservative pro approach, but the spy is popped. The red team could actually fly in and engage here because Victor Magnuson is Ooh. not in the place. Ooh. Yeah, they're just barely avoiding death here. So even that retreat cost them a fair bit, with the Nugget launcher now barely alive. It looks like the boot turned themselves into a worse position. Victor Magnuson wanted to pull away the Minty Breeze from the cover it was using. No double fire going out on the Jupiter. Jupiter could be in trouble here, but he's still got a lot of armor. Carlin and Victor Magnuson is losing his balloon. Ball was low. He's recovering now in together. And even now, the the red team has some really solid cover on their end. Yes, and the fight is starting to turn into a favor. If they can pop this magnate, or if they can kill this fire. Oh! Oof. Down goes the spire. The spire. <laughs> <laughs> they might be able to bring this home. I'm not looking at a 3 3. Yeah, I'm surprised you don't see the Jupiter just turn and look to fly in immediately. I mean, they might be scared of the um, spy spawn and a repeat of the first engagement where they went in and they suffered. I mean, they've got about the same perma. This is true. I think, um, really, it needs to be the Magnate aggressing too at the same time, but they're looking to move in slowly. Yeah, Blue Team now forced into their spawn, and it's looking rather barren of covers here. Especially for the spy who's not choosing to move into cover. Could be dangerous for him. It's not a fantastic position for Jupiter though, especially if Blue Team can force crossfire and completely block out this cover. It looks like that's what they're doing and it looks like Jupiter's about Ooh. to die. And he does. He goes oh, there we go. <laughs> it was a slow parable and Magnuson sees it the opportunity. Rushing in on the TPs. Artemis going out. It's the Lumberjack, looking for the whole break. Wants to run him. Gets the kill. Alright, and Blue Team or the um, Fly Me Closer takes home another victory. This one a bit closer than the last one though. And I I'd say a lot more interesting. Yeah, for sure. Um, it was a lot more competitive, the fight. Couldn't quite tell what was going to happen. And you had some... Um, development here in how the teams process the games. I do think the Jupiter could have been more aggressive, but really he was lacking the hydrogen to fly in low and climb up high. Yeah. I think that might have helped him make some engagements happen. It's interesting, sometimes you see um, a ship fail an approach, or a team fail an approach that was close to working, and then they choose to play the game a different way. And actually, if they'd just got the execution off properly, uh, it actually had a better strategy for winning the game originally. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah, sometimes you see maladaptation instead of positive maladaptations. Yeah, now we're moving on to Canyon Ambush, a map I am willing to bet money won't be voted away. And the map voting process has opened up. Is this a two-team crucible? Yes, Artemis, it is. And it seems like Chad has also taken um, 
Take a note of the um, Fly Me Closer's um, three-letter anagram, which is Pook. Yeah, and the teams have agreed. Play on Canyon Ambush. It's not a Sildar in the same the lobby. He's not surprised, and I don't think we are either. Quite a popular map. It's usually one that's open to multiple playstyles. Yeah, and so we see the four minute timer going on. Yeah, it seems like we're going to see a bit more brawl here. Pyramidian Stormbreaker, Pyramidian Spire. I've seen the spire become a fish. And the lobby is starting to look more and more like the... Um, like the meta we're used to seeing in um in SES and the like. Given it's been it's been a very volatile meta the last the last few months. A lot of things have changed. I think we've seen a lot of Pyramidians um coupled with a, a fast and nimble ship uh, able of doing some uh some disables. It's been quite a healthy meta, and I think that we see pilots taking things that they want to take on, not necessarily things that they would like to take, but we're seeing different styles develop. Um, for example, we've seen the Pablos with their art link and the last variety of ships paired with it. We've seen the Clear Water we start to use Lumberjack extensively. Um, and we've seen other chip teams start to use Fish um, quite effectively too. However, I do feel like we're getting closer to a, a more stagnant point in the meta. Involving Stormbreakers, Pyramidians, Goldfishes, and a couple And maybe some Lumberjacks. Yes. <laughs> What would you say is the strongest ship, in your opinion, at the moment? The one strongest ship? If you asked me two months ago, I would definitely just say the Artling, straight up and down. Mm. However, I feel like it's been so prevalent in the last few, um... Or in the last months, that people have figured out ways to beat them. So, I'm gonna have to say the fish, due to it being all around really strong, and I don't feel, feel like there's many wrong times to pick a fish in a composition. I think I'm, uh, I think I'm gonna agree with you there. It's a wise word. It's a ship that can handle almost anything. Of course, there's going to be one v one compositions that um, that beat the fish. Yes, I feel like there are a lot of places where they do fit in. So, um, it's just so hard to pin down the fish with um, with any ship. There is one Definitely. ship that comes to mind that is pretty effective, and That's the big fat Corsa, but that ship in itself is a dangerous thing to pick at times. Yeah, definitely a bit more niche. Mm. 
and towards the last uh, minutes of the lobby time of that, we didn't see many changes. We're still watching the um, Pyramidian Goldfish, Pyramidian Stormbreaker setup, and we're heading into the game. Yeah, interestingly, one of the Pyramidians is a Hades Black, no, Hades Artemis Pyramidian instead of a Gatling Artemis. And I think we have an interesting dynamic here. We'll introduce the ships first. Yeah, so first we're going to look at the Victor, piloted by Victor, or, or by, piloted by Sunstream, sorry. It is an Ardling, so Gatling and Artemis, Flame on 3 and Flak on the back. Then you've got the Sus, piloted by Captain Jan. It is a Watcher fish with the right side Gatling, left side Carronade, and back Carronade as well. And tip number 3 is the Chariot, piloted by the Menchu, it's a Pyramidian with a Hades Artemis front, a Gatling black side. Ship number four is the other ship piloted by Verame. It's a Stormbreaker, carrying with it a Watcher and a Gatling and two Banshees. Yeah, so you were going to mention something about an interesting dynamic here. Yeah, so the Chariot is Hades Artemis. It's going to pressure the Victor a lot at range, but it's going to be pretty useless against it if the Victor gets close. Can the other ship, the Stormbreaker, prevent the Victor from getting close? Kind of, but not really, because that fish is going to be really annoying for the other ship, as we're seeing right now. Watch is going out. Uh, the chariot might get a good flank on them here, as it was going over the cliff. Yeah, but Stormbreaker did not expect the ramp on the Victor. It puts his balloon really low. He's now being chased by the fish, and I don't think he's going to avoid the watcher. You know what? Yeah, other ship loses everything it dies. Oh, they, they just died! Yes, I they missed that died. completely. I expected them to run for a bit longer. Looks <laughs> <laughs> so like Chariot cannot quite get some whole damage, and so it's likely going to just burn here. Yeah, uh, it did have the upper hand until the Sus actually appeared. It did yes. get the uh, engines of the Victor while appearing behind it. Indeed. It was in a really solid position. Unfortunately, he didn't predict the hydrogen from the Victor until he wasn't able to maintain arcs. Um, now he's just going down. Uh, he probably could have got some permanent damage. Yeah, now like we mentioned, I mean the Hades up close, it's not really doing anything, it's tickling them, if anything. So, as I originally said, the Stormbreaker will be annoyed by the fish. What really turned the fight in the fish's favour really quickly was the ramp from the Pyramidium. Just taking out its balloon. That just stopped the Stonebreaker from having any chances of dodging the heart and even dodging the run. Yeah, um, removed one dimension of movement. Precisely. So yeah. let's see blue team. if they Yeah? Yeah, blue team spawn in. Let's see if they are capable of dodging the fish in the next fight. Now looking at the team's positions, this is going to be a bit more of an open fight if they start spotting each other here now in the blue team spawn. Waiting and being sneaky, trying to go around. Trying to get close, which would give them the advantage on the chariot. They could have spot on the chariot. The blue team know where the red ships are, or it looks like they do. Yes, red goldfish spotted. However, the Stormbreaker is not spotted, which could be dangerous for the Victor, so he's being slightly conservative here. No, it looks like he's rushing into the chariot. Yeah, <laughs> it was a weird way of being slightly conservative. <laughs> <laughs> Will the Stormbreaker come in in time? Looks like uh, a ram would kill them. Oh, that's a wonderful watcher on the Victor. You know, all the engines. Victor's in a fishy spot here, and he's gonna die before very long. And she goes out early on the other ship, and that's a shame because they're ignoring the watcher. I would have the But into the, the wall! Yes. <laughs> Amazing, no engines to break that. <laughs> <laughs> no engines, you can't slow down. So, Zeus is in a dangerous spot, he is flying into the ground. Maybe we can get out. Seeing the engines at half health, one of them is very low. And it looks like he might not be able to escape. 
We managed to round the corner here, but the uh, watch of the other ship is not far behind. The elite is running kerosene, so he's able to recover his engine spots, but I mean, just watching it. Another victor is here in the Eastern Passage, ready to help their ally. Perhaps he will adapt his fight and be a bit more careful when the Stormbreaker's not spotted. Yeah, there's always a big risk leaving the uh, Stormbreaker free, because even if they're small, they do have a lot of guns on that thing. Indeed, and we did see the watch of fish use this heavy gun before the Stormbreaker came in, so that could be a little finer adaptation they could make. We could just make sure they save the watch and maybe even shoot the Gatling at the Pyramidian. The Stormbreaker does not fly in. But we'll see how they adapt in the next fight. He's just taking a precarious path here. And he scouts and he sees no one and he backs off. So now we can probably predict where the blue team are coming from. Nonetheless, they choose to fly through the Eastern <laughs> Passage. We've got a miniature ring around the roses going on here now. Red team mm -hmm. heading into the blue team spawn. Looks like Chariot's trying to set up an overwatch, but he's just going to miss the victor now as he's flying forwards. Red team are going deep into the seven spawn. Oh, big bounds on the Zeus. <laughs> oh, they managed. Oh no! Oh, this is really managing. dangerous. <laughs> Could be even more dangerous with the red team with the blue team looping out faster. Chasing yeah, they were going inside the cliff there. Those hitboxes yes. are really, really weird. Seems like um, the the pilot of the chariot was too busy typing, laying down, get them. <laughs> <laughs> to actually chase after the red ships. At this side, at this point, both teams have got to be really careful. They don't know where the other teams are at all. Yeah, all the information they have right now is that they're not in their respective spawns. Now they do oh. know that the chariot mm -hmm. is in the entrance to their own spawn. Will they rush into the chariot again? What well, the chariot does have terrain behind him? So if he's not careful, that could be an obstacle in this engagement. They seem to have learned a bit here. They seem to have a more reserved approach before they know where the other ship is. Indeed, and if anything, he's at least moving to the cover. Use that to get closer and avoid the Hades. Goldfish is standing behind the pyramid in, in a pretty good position to protect it. It's backside. However, they are losing the formation here slightly. The victor is quite low, so he could be pummeled by Hades. Hades goes out, it's very accurate. Three shots hitting. Four, five, six shots. Into six. The hole. Really good shots. Hades. They're not letting the victor. Any respite. Yeah, that wasn't really good harassment by the other ship. However, the other ship has a very low main engine, so it's going to slow down its maneuverability. The Victor's got very low balloon here and armor. It's not in the best position to start shooting. Watch it goes out another ship. Only taking out a side engine whilst the Victor is pumped. Victor's being hit by Hades. He's gonna have to back. Now the fish wants to go into the Stormbreaker. And he rops out the main engine and the side engine. The A very solid watch up from Zeus. His chariot needs to supply more pressure here. Oh, Flax going out! Other oh, ship almost dead! He's so close. 
seeing the other ship's got its engines restored, but it's flying away and giving the Victor off. So it would be very dangerous for the other ship. Chariot's able to swap here, the other ship goes down. Autogon gets the disable just a moment too late. For a few moments too late. Chariot Another chariot alone looking. versus two ship. It's not looking good. Ball goes up, and he goes down. This, put, this puts red team in a really solid position. They're in the blue team spawn. And they're looking at a 4 to 1 right now. So the real question is, where is blue team going to spawn? They can choose the western spawn, that would be a bad idea. They take the deep spawn and east fleet. So, I think the key thing in the last fight was the... Actually, they had a really good advantage on the victim. But the other ship was letting the fish shoot Huacha. And it hit the side engine, it hit the main engine. And that really was the moment the fight turned around. And also the fact the chariot was not able to pump out enough pressure on the fish, but that's kind of expected. So let's Yeah, they see. did have some really good pressure on the Pyramidian though. Hmm. Let's see if we can reproduce that engagement, but it looks like red team are just gonna get in close and blue team. Chariot's not moving very quickly, which I know he is. <laughs> Spot us out on the chariot once again, but the other ship's still unspotted. So, big risk for the red team if they do want to go in. Looks like the Stormbreaker has no idea or we would be closer to the chariot here. Chariot is relatively safe, but the victor wants to close the gap for something to happen. This is looking dangerously close to the first engagement where they lost their victor. But it looks like here we're going to be losing the chariot because the other ship is very slow to get the engagement. Yeah. It was very cautious. Two engines out on the victor. This goldfish is in a very strong position and the chariot's about to dump and die. Yeah. Pushed against the cliffs. And with that victory, that means that so far the red team has amassed 18 points. They're looking really good for this Crucible. It's actually difficult for teams to come back in 2v2 Crucibles. I think we have seen it done. We've seen a reverse sweep. But usually it does... Uh, Results in quite some hardship for one side. Now, we're on Periton Rumble, another map that I would be willing to bet that no one is really going to vote out of. It's 
as a special map, but I feel like it's a very popular map in the hearts of the people. I think I would agree. It's definitely a very special map for me. It's an... Part of at least what makes it special for me personally is you're just able to get into cover, get loose spots, and completely change your position in a way that you can't really do on other maps. Yeah, definitely also, a very quick and dynamic map. Yes, and there's, there's also no massive open spaces, and which can lead to more one dimensional fights. I think it's kind of unique in that sense. I mean, I've I've had some some uh, experiences on this map. I remember using the. Um, well, I used to believe that this was the close range map, and you couldn't take anything other but close range. But we've seen a whole lot of great examples of Team Spring long range to this map, lumberjacks and things like that. And making use of the long sidelines that you can get through the alleys in some points of this map. Yeah, it was it was surprising um, when I was first uh, playing the game, and then normal lobbies, I never saw anyone use lumberjacks, and I saw the use of lumberjacks in competitive games by the top teams. I was surprised by yeah, that. Yeah, I think we're. We're both talking about the riders with the galleons, most probably, right? Yes, indeed. And um, then I learned about little strategies like circling the map. Uh, actually, that was effective with lumberjacks. Because um, if you're a galleon, you, you don't want to sit in the middle of the map where you can be approached from all sides. If you're on the edge of the map, you're in a better position. Yes you're not going to be flanked, or if you are flanked, they're going to drive right into your closer inside. Um, and then afterwards I learnt about uh, thinking about what the enemy is doing when they're not spotted. And on Paraton that's an especially interesting thing, because it's such a sh short map, a uh, small map. You can scout ahead half the map, and then it's really interesting to think about, well, if the enemy's coming from this point, I'll be in trouble. If they're coming from this point, I'll be at an advantage. And balancing that risk in your mind is a really fun game to play. Definitely, definitely. And also, especially with those galleons, because of how slow they are to react to things. It's, but even with faster ships, um, it is... Uh, a very interesting dynamic. Yeah, and it's definitely a, a skill I think most of the uh, top tier pilots and crew of the Guns of Vigorous community have developed over over the time this game has been a thing. In the olden days we would never see Spires on Paraton because it's such a squishy ship. However, Paraton does let you engage quickly, and the Spire does have a lot of guns, so it can be a really powerful gas cannon if you use it wisely here. Yeah, yeah also turning use... those corners really quickly. Yeah, uh, that's a very big thing too. Um, but since the whole buff, I think it's a really strong ship on this map. You do usually see, see them out. I'm missing one on either side, I think. Definitely. Also going to take the time to say, Dirk Hamilton, thank you for the three months of Twitch Prime. I 
And thank you to all the other viewers, of course. You guys are the thing keeping me doing this. Now, one minute on the clock. It doesn't seem like the teams are going to be changing anymore. Spire and Pyramidian versus Spire and Magnate. So, Blue Team might have a bit more long-range capability here. I don't know about what they have on that Magnate. It looks like they've got a two Gatlings, an Artemis, and a Flak. Quite a versatile robot. It's a very mid-range then, maybe, this this whole battle. Um, so the Strom Delight does have a Lumberjack, and that could be the deciding factor. The Great BGS is carrying a Caronate, and it looks like one team is looking for direction. Whilst, as we mentioned before, Strom is looking to utilize that Lumberjack with the long sidelines. I think the Lumberjack will have an advantage here, if they pay close attention. Uh, yeah, a lot of scary places to, to get on. stuck. Yes. Uh, really, it could go either way. I'm looking forward to this one. Yes, this is going to be a question of whether Red Team can close the distance. They do have a bit of a more brawl loadout on their ships. But that said, Blue Team is not defenseless in a brawl. They do have, they do have some things brought with them as well. Indeed, and um, that's why Red Team can close the distance, but they have to close the distance instantly. They want to take the advantage. Yeah, so looking at the great uh, VGS, the Spire piloted by Dementio, you've got Spire and Banshee upper deck with a Carronade and a Banshee lower deck. And then you've got the Serious Business piloted by Where Am I, a Artling. So Art uh, Artemis and Gatling up top, Banshee on three and Flak on the back. And then we have the Strong Delight, the Spire piloted by Sunstrom. It's a Lumberjack, Gatling, Double Banshee, Spire. And then we have the Burst Banshee, a Magnet, piloted by Captain Yan. It's a Watcher, Gatling, Artemis on the right side, and a Watcher, Gatling, Flak on the left side. And spots are out almost immediately here. The great VGS already firing towards the Storm Delight. And he's in a great position. Um, can he... he gets the pop, does he? Yes, he does get the pop on Storm Delight. Storm Delight's in a good position to back off here. And we see the Watcher go out on the great VGS. That can really turn the fight here. The great VGS is about to be whole broken. Will he die here? Yeah, the no, serious business not. is behind the boss Banashi. It looks like the Gatling's not going out effectively. They get a whole break, but no flux are going out now. And are they going to go for the ram? Yes, they are. If the Great VGS can survive this, they might be in a position, but Strong Delight is coming away at the serious business. Looks like Red Team has this. VGS is losing home. VGS is most certainly dead here. Yeah, yeah there, there they go. <laughs> Boss Panashi might <laughs> suffer some perma damage here though. I think on all the flats, they're at 50%. That one's going up. Can we get another hole break? And they do. They cannot get any damage on the hill. Yeah. The ram gave them the hull break, but the ram also put them out of position to do anything with their explosive guns. It's like the repairs are very effective on the armor of the Burst Banashi. Either that, or the Gatling's missing. But they've done a really good job of keeping the hull. In that type. Yeah, which is usually impressive because the whole engineer on the magnet is usually very isolated. But they do have a fail safe on the back, and I'm wondering whether Xenix uh, is fail safing the whole in the fight. Probably not, is Could... what my instinct wants to say when they're being popped. Yeah. But <laughs> I'll, I'll, keep a, I'll keep my eye out for it at least. Yeah, because it could pay off, but it also means you're slower on the guns, you're slower on the balloon repairs. There's a bit of a payoff. Mm. 
It's definitely worth it if you're being shot by another ship from behind. Both of your ships are ignoring it. Um, so. Interesting formation here on the map. Some blue team staring across towards the red ships. However, it doesn't look like they can see them because of the buildings. Yeah, and the red team, like we mentioned, they have to be really careful about picking their engagements. Because they can't afford to get popped at a range like this. Precisely. It's just why I'm surprised they're flying through the center of the map where it's really easy to see. These uh, squares in the middle, B2, B3, C2 and C3, are the easiest squares to see from any point in the map. So I'm surprised that they would have both of their ships flying through them when they want to ambush the blue ships. Yeah, and even if the blue ships, they, they did get a spot, but they didn't get any fire on, now they have an idea about where they are, which is bad for the red team. Yeah, it would take a long time for them to lose the positions. Fire is going out on this fire, the great VGS. Lumberjack's hitting their balloon now. Armor yeah, and popped. Boots. We see two banshees hit the hole. The bumper gets the ground and lose half their health. I mean, more serious business is here. It breaks the strong delight but gets no permanent damage over the non-ultimate strong. That's just the AoE damage of the items. Some great VGS rushing again. And this could be great or it could be terrible for them. They're in a great position now. They've managed to avoid most of the banshees from the strong delight. Great VGS is above both ships. But the serious business is in an awkward position as they've only got one peephole to shoot through. And the Great VGS goes for the best Banashi, but it chooses to ignore the strong light. Not a good decision, but they manage to maintain the home. And again, as you said, serious business is not able to come out and shoot either of the blue ships. And. He's putting pressure on strong delight, he's running the. Him. Some perma, but not a lot. <laughs> and now he's just grinding into the buildings. I don't feel like serious business has committed his fair share of that fight. You see, there's Panashi got the watch of the engines of the serious business. Oh, bigger watcher. The ship goes down too. Yeah, the last fight felt like the Great VGS committed wholeheartedly and the Pyramidian was still a bit unsure about whether or not they wanted that engagement. Indeed, and it also felt like the VGS was ignoring the wrong ship there. Maybe they wanted to help the ally against the Magni, but if they were to do that, they would have to stay above the Spire while shooting the Magni, and it didn't. They let the Spire get some distance. The Spire could shoot with Gatling, with Lumberjack, with Banshees, and... That was the great VGS's demise. Yeah, oh, big spawn! Oh. <laughs> yeah, the quite from the light in the There's business so broken. Business. So this business is half. But as Panashi not as popped. It's from the lights being left for free. The that was a mess of a last fight, but it seems like... Well, when you spawn in like that, that is a, a slight buffer between you spawning in and everyone getting to their positions. And that buffer is usually deadly in a fight. It usually means that you're gonna take a whole lot of damage before you actually manage to fire back. Yep, and it means the enemy can get out of arcs of you. It means your ship's not buffed. Not fail safe. It's, it's really not a good position to be in. That might also just have been a miscalculation from the red team. Perhaps the red team are feeling a bit of fatigue there. Having lost four games already? Yes. 
And so now we'll be moving on to our final game. Which shall be played With on. Duel at Dawn. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you never know with this crucible business. This one I'm a bit more unsure on. It is not as widely popular as the last two we saw. It's not. I um, wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. The reason for that was uh, the spawn camping issue. That the spawns were too close and... It was too easy to go with them all. Um, but since the map changes by Richard Lemoon, the uh, expansion of the map, I feel like it's not as problematic as it was before. I think the map is a lot better whenever I played on it. I just suspect that it's the negative stigma still attached because people don't get to play on it too often. But I do enjoy yeah, it used to be on only it. two squares across. Wasn't it? Um, something like um, that. Something like that. It could have been two squares. Yeah, but I won't be surprised if we see a vote for something like Water Hazard or some of the more neutral maps in people's minds. Indeed. Part of the reason why I like it currently is that it's similar to Parton in the aspect of it really there's no dragging out fights. Like you can use cover and such, but you cannot like travel a thousand meters to avoid the enemy. And usually you cannot like use extremely long range ships, especially because of the clouds. So it has a nice close range for all we feel to. Well, again, we do see lumberjacks because they're very effective um, when used in conjunction with the cover that's offered on this map. If you have a galleon or a crusader or a magnate, you can use the ribs, um, the big metal structures, uh, to pop out, shoot your lumberjack, pop a ship, and then move back into cover whilst you reload, whilst you repair up. And it's quite an effective method of fighting enemies here. In a yeah, but it seems like we're saying a duel of here, actually. Yes. I think one big thing about Lumberjacks on this map as well is that mm. while the Lumberjack is a really long-range weapon, I feel like to get the really consistent hits, you're usually between 500 to 1500 meters, which is the longer ranges of this map. There's no fights outside of that range, only inside of that range. Indeed. Um, so it's not drastic because you can be shooting across the whole map to get the Lumberjack going. And we do see teams do that starting the Lumberjack. And trying to get spots early with one scouting ship and using the other ship to run the jack down the other ships. I think it's also useful to note that the lumberjacks still effective up to about 220 meters. Is that the arming range of the burst ammunition, maybe? Yes, uh, so if you're using burst ammunition, you can still pop something that's just over 220 meters away. And that's uh, about half a square. And sometimes in a lot of engagements, just being able to get that first pop is enough to turn the fight. Yeah, and, mo and on most ships that we see, they usually bring a lumberjack. They usually have enough surplus guns that they can change into a into a completely different setup once they're getting close. Precisely. 
Like we saw the spy uh, on Derelict Deception bringing the Lumberjack, but also bringing Double Gatling and Flak. Exactly. And so all we're really seeing is the Lumberjacks used to keep one engineer busy, make it easier to hit the ship, and also perhaps to be able to escape the arcs of the ship if required. Um, but the Lumberjack could be used for any of those purposes, and it doesn't have to be used for any of them, as long as it's used. So some people think that the Lumberjack's only useful if you can use it to avoid arcs, but that's not really the case. It's quite a versatile tool. Um, yeah, it does a lot. It denies them one dimension of movement. They're only going to be going down from there. Indeed. I think all you have to do is you just have to imagine that you're on the ship being hit by the Lumberjack, and then you'll, then you'll realize how useful the gun is, even at close ranges, if it can get pops. Uh, having this discussion, we are seeing a Lumberjack on either side. I'm guessing on the Magnate and on the Spire, perhaps? Or is right. it on either Magnate? It's on one Magnate and on one Spire. And this is interesting because the Magnate can use cover with the Lumberjack, whereas the Spire can not use it very easily. And if the Spire is going to be marked by the enemy Magnate, say if every time he comes out of cover he's going to be popped, he's not going to have a good time, especially because the Spire's got very little armor, and it's a long walk back up to the hull from the balloon. So the Magnate could have a yeah, the Magnet could have a favourable outlook in this fight. Yeah, and then there's the ma uh, matchup of the... what I assume is a Brawl Magnet versus a Pyramidian. And this is an interesting one. The Pyramidian kind of dominates it, unless the Magnet can get close and use its watches. The Pyramidian can disable a watcher, but it cannot disable both watches of the Magnet. And so it is very dangerous if the Pyramidian lets that Magnet get close, either due to terrain or because he needs to protect his ally. So we'll see how it goes. Yes, I'm gonna sort of immediately small map. <laughs> We've got the Storm Delight piloted by Sunstream. Lumber Spire with top deck Gatling and Banshee, lower deck Banshee. And then you've got the Boss Panashi Magnet piloted by Captain Jan, left side Gatling, Flak and Watcher, and a Gatling Artemis Watcher on the other side. Ship freeze a Jabberwocky piloted, a magnetic piloted by a Dementio left side, Hades flat, Lumberjack, right side, Gatling, Watcher, and Heavy Flak at the front. And Chip 4 is serious business, an Artling, a Permitting piloted by a Veramai, Gatling, Artemis front, and a flat side with an Artemis on the back. And they are currently using both of those Artemises against the Burst Panashi. Jabberwock is popped and this is Hades. Strong Delight's rushing down into the pyramid in here. And surprisingly, uh, they did not put the Lumberjack on the spire. And the serious business oh. is suffering for it. The Bosman actually has suffered some perma as well. Fabric was on the pyramid in the dead bun, but now Strong Delight's being popped. Strong Delight's being broken on us. He's broken, but no flax on him. Flags are going out. There comes the flags. And we see blue team starting to take control, but Jabberwock is like the ball magnet person. Strong Delight's broken in the bumps. This is half his health. And yeah, the series business is in a really good position here with the height and the Artemises. Ooh! Wow. Really efficient kill there on the blue team's magnet. That. Indeed, they got the whole break and they just sent. They just sent them home. Clutches <laughs> <laughs> and flags went out at the perfect time. Yeah, that was a massive game changer in favor of the red team. I'm, uh, I'm not actually sure how the best Panashi managed to turn that into their favor. Maybe it was the use of the Bugatling or. Maybe it was just persistent Gatling. Yeah, but getting that hold down, or, or, or yeah, in, in that amount of time, they must have been hitting with both Flax and Hawatcha at the same time. I think so. Um, 
it's nothing that we won't want to go back and watch. It's depressing. So here they are, covering one of the spawns. The blue team spawn in, not in an optimal position here. They don't have much time to set up. Javelwalk and they need to get that pop with the lumber. Jamwalk is blue broken and whole broken already. They do pop the spire, but they lose 75% of their art of their HP. They just want to kill Jabberwock here. Jabberwock yeah, but the Bolton Ash is taking a lot of damage. But the Jabberwock goes down again, yeah. Really good Bolton double Ash pressure. It's not losing its health. This is really unfortunate for this team. And that's the trade off with the Artemis. Sure, you've got great control, but once you get that opportunity to kill. And they do have an opportunity to kill. But there's Panashi for them. It's again. That's really a serious business looking in a good position to get out of it, actually. Oh, but the Gatlings are coming out. Balloon goes out. They're not getting out of here at all. But you were right. I'm surprised they were not burning backwards. They had full engines. Um, so I'm yeah, I was surprised. Th that. They should have burned all the way away from there. Maybe taken some cover by the big ship here. And just turned and run. And they also had a fairly obvious skill on the right gate. But the flak was not ready. Um, I, I suppose it's... Uh, it's hard in the Crucible of Five games. And yeah, I guess they thinking. had their fair share of um, they had their fair share of repairs to be doing at the time as well. Hmm. It's understandable. Definitely, there are so many variables to this game that. No scenario is ever the same. It's not Jabberwocky taking on the jack. So is Burst Finashi. Strong Delight is fairly safe at the moment. And Lucian do not really have the position that they want to. Or Spanashi moving in. They need to be careful not to get isolated from the Storm Delight there. Red team are also struggling to find a good engagement there. Magnets moving forwards. He's not looking for cover, but he's just looking to, to shoot the spire, and this is looking good for them. It should be enough as long as a serious business composition smart. First, when Ashley's going in for the flying, the team can be aggressive here on the spire, or they can make sure they watch out for the magnet. Worst yeah, if this keeps up, Spire space. is getting deprived of positions to take here. Indeed. Will Ooh, Boss Panashi double gathering coming in on the serious business. That's double gathering. The flak is ready and the flak will go out. Well, perhaps oh, oh, oh. for some reason. Serious business uh, still in a lot of danger here. Yeah, and double flak at this time. The flak is ready and they take the kill. That's very good use of the Wogalling Quack for ongoing Magnet. Yeah, we saw some just... very quick kills from the Magnet. Yeah. Alright, so that does it, and the red team will be taking home the last victory here, landing them at the full jackpot of 30 points, I believe. Yeah, indeed. It was a shame to see the blue team are not aggressive enough there. 
it would be a bit too careful, but it, again, it's understandable. Um, it's yeah, they also didn't know the where the magnet was. It could have been sitting there, hiding, ready to pounce on whatever moved into the ribs. Mm -hmm. Indeed, and like we said, we don't, the pyramid didn't want to get too close to it. Um, so it was a clever play by the magnet, and it was really well executed, I think. Uh, other than the flak not being shot at the start. Yeah, so the silly walk ministers land on four points this um, crucible, with flyers closer landing on the big jackpot of 30 points. Now, I mean, looking at the points, this looks incredibly one-sided, but I think the blue team at certain points during this crucible really gave the red team a run for their money, even if the score tells us otherwise. It didn't make it easy. Perhaps except for the first game. And it's unfortunate to see them lose in such a rough way. However, they definitely have put up a good fight, and the red team have displayed some good tactics here. Definitely think it's been a, a good crucible in some ways. Yeah, I think we saw a high level of communication. I mean, we can only assume, of course, but I think we saw a high level of communication from the red team. Captain Jan and Sunstrom, I think. I we think can assume we saw, that they communicated very well. I think we saw good level of communication from the blue team to from Maramai and Denantio. And perhaps the confidence was dropping off towards the end. But they definitely put up some now coordinated fights. Yeah. So that's going to do it for this week's Crucible. Um, thank you everyone for watching. Thank you Hellfire for dropping in and casting with me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dimitri. And thank you to Senok and all the organizers for making this happen. And that's going to be it for us this evening. Of course, check out SES tomorrow. Probably going to be great. And the 3v3 tournament coming up next week, of course, on Saturday. Yes, I think it's worth mentioning that tomorrow will be a 3v3 SES. So it will be a that's definitely worth mentioning. <laughs> it be quite a difference. Yeah. But right. that's going to be it for us. I'm going to sign off. Welcome, Ghost, to the commentator's booth. Uh, yeah, have a good night, people. Good night.